Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Chronicle Podcast channel. This is episode 43, the establishment of the Tang Dynasty. Now firstly, I would like to wish all of you a very happy Chinese New Year. Whether you are in China, the USA, the UK, or anywhere else in the world, Chun Jie Kuai Le. I've already done an episode on the stories behind the Chinese New Year, so be sure to check it out. It's episode 15, or the link is in the description of this podcast episode for you. Now in this episode, we got to the planning of rebellion by Li Yuan and how he was going to make his move. We will discuss the consequential battle with the Sui and the first emperor of the Tang Dynasty. From his powerful position in Taiyuan, Shanxi province, on the 6th of July, 617, Li Yuan proclaimed that he was going to support the King of Dai as the new emperor of the Sui dynasty. For most people, this seemed rather odd. I thought he was going to proclaim a new dynasty, but no. Now the reason why is because people fought for power, yes, but in the name of the Sui dynasty. Of course, whoever secured the most power first would then proclaim their own new dynasty. And as well as that, King Dai, or the King of Dai, sorry, he was still a child. So that played a huge role into Li Yuan doing this. Because if it's a child, of course, he can name himself Chancellor or whatever title he wants and then later on down the line, remove him, which is basically what happened. Anyway, previous to this proclamation, Previous to this proclamation, Li Yuan ensured that his northern frontier was secured by offering an alliance and military aid from the Turks, to which they agreed. So now that he was covered in the north, he simply had to march west and take the capital Dasin, or Chang'an, or modern-day Xi'an. The most direct, direct route was to march beside the Fen River, which connects to the Yellow River, then head toward Dasin through the mountain passes which surrounded the river. The use of the terrain really did help the Tang conceal their army and therefore their intention to rebel until the latest minute possible. As for the commanders, etc., we will just focus on the Li family for the purpose of time. Li Yuan was obviously the head of the entire operation. Uh, Then you have Li Jiancheng, or the eldest brother. He was the leader of the army of the left. And then you have Li Shimin, who was the re- leader of the army of the right. The youngest son, Li Yuanji, was left in Taiyuan to keep the house in order, whilst the Tang army made their bid for power. Li Yuan led his forces to their first major obstacle in the pouring summer rain, the city of Huayi, commanded by Song Laosheng. However, it seemed that their campaign might not be off to a good start. The torrential rain made the movement of provisions extremely slow, and they couldn't keep up with the army. As well as that, the Tang leadership heard that a warlord named Liu Wu Zhou allied himself with the Turks to the north and planned to attack Jinyang. That city, by the way, was very close to Taiyuan, and is basically their entire base of operations. So many of the UN's advisors suggested that the campaign be abandoned and the army should return to protect their home base. However, it was Li Shimin who spoke up against this advice, saying, The crops are ripe, and in our front is Song Laosheng, who is not a great military leader. Liu Wuzhou is not really in agreement with the Turks. If we give up our march to Daxin, what are we trying to do? Be bandits like the rest? If so, would our men follow us? Rather, we should continue with our expedition and pick up the pieces later. After intense debates back and forth, Li Yuan agreed with Li Shimin and the campaign was still on. Shimin's predictions turned out to be correct. The supplies arrived and there was no threat to their home base. Further to that, the rain stopped. So now it was time to take the first city, Huo Yi. Li Shimin was also correct on his analysis of Song Laosheng as a military leader too, but I'll get to that later. The problem facing the Tang forces was simple. Here they were on a narrow pass with a fortress blocking their way. 
They had no siege equipment, and the enemy army, some 20,000 strong, were tucked away behind their walls quite comfortably. So what should they do? Well, in this scenario, Ximin pointed out that hurling insults at Sun Lao Shong would be enough to make their latter sally his forces out of the castle and fight in the open field. A prediction which turned out to be correct. Hey everyone, look at Sun Lao Shong hiding behind that wall. His ancestors must be very proud of him, right? I heard his wife was beautiful as well. I can't wait to defeat him and then take his wife home with me as a concubine. Hey, the wife's mine. I'm the eldest brother, not you. Well then, we will fight for her. How about that? Haha, <laughs> your mum's bells. Oh, I can't wait to get my hands on those two so I can beat them to death. That's it. Men, get ready. We're going out. Enraged by the insults Shimin and his brother were hurling at him, Sun Lao Shong gave the order to sally his men out and fight the enemy. However, as his men were trying to get assembled outside the wall, they were attacked on two sides by the Tang forces. Li Yuan led the central charge with his eldest son on the east gate. Li Shimin, on the other hand, led his forces to attack the south gate. Li Yuan met the main army, led by Sun Lao Shong, and was actually getting beaten back. Shumin, on the other hand, was having much more success. It is said that Shumin led from the front, smashing his cavalry into the enemy ranks. Using twin sabres, he slashed and cut at his enemies, so much so that his sleeves were drenched in blood. In a sudden battle rage, Shumin ripped his clothes off and kept hacking away at the enemy troops until his swords were completely blunted. Seeing a mad raven lunatic as a leader made the forces of the south gate run back into the walls. Meanwhile, at the east gate, both forces thought Shumin had broken into the city, so the defenders tried to let some troops get back through the gates to get to the south gate to help defend it. Seeing his chance, Li Yuan ordered a second charge, which broke Song Lao Shun's men. The soldiers of Song's army were so scared that they closed the gate whilst their commander was still outside it. In a panic, they threw down a rope to their commander in order for him to climb up the wall. But as he climbed up the rope, a Tang officer pulled him down and killed him on the spot. With the initial battle won and the enemy commander killed, the Tang forces withdrew to regroup for the final assault the next day. The problem they faced now though, was that they didn't have any siege equipment. So to get around this, they used human ladders. Yes, you heard that correctly. They used human ladders to scale the city walls. To motivate everyone to participate in the assault, the UN announced, in the rain of arrows and stones in the battlefield, both noblemen and humbled servants are equally exposed to death. Why should there be any difference then when they are rewarded? So they should be justly rewarded if they render the same service. Now I don't know about you, but that really wouldn't motivate me to climb on a comrade's back to try and help another comrade climb on my back to then get on a city wall. But that's just my opinion. The ferocious fighting led the officials in the city to come to the conclusion that it was better to let the Tang army in rather than fight to the death. And so by the 4th of August, Hua Yi officially surrendered to Li Yuan. Wanting to main maintain good relations, Li Yuan didn't harm the civilians inside the city and gave them all food. At the same time, he turned the newly captured city into another base of operations, and he recruited able-bodied men into his army. I bet all of those men agreed upon the condition that they joined Shumin's trip after seeing the absolute madman on the battlefield. <laughs> the Tang army then came across little resistance up until their main objective. And to save time, I will quote Julian Romain in his incredible book Rise of the Tang Dynasty, The Reunification of China and the Military Response to the Steppe Nomads, AD 581-626. to Here's the quote. Li Yuan and his army soon resumed the expedition to Guangzhou. On the 8th of August, they took Lin Fan and its hinterland. On the 13th, they took Jiang 
Xinjiang, Shanxi, and on the 15th, they reached Longmen, Yumenko, on the east bank of the Yellow River. Before them, beyond the Great Yellow River, was their objective. The geography sounder in the Guangzhou Plain was what troubled the Yuan more than anything else. The Guangzhou Plain, by the way, is where the Fen River meets the Yellow River, and where, if you look at a map, you will see the river take a 90 degree turn toward the east. The Wei River, a tributary river for the Yellow River, also connects to the yellow one at this point. I know it's confusing, but I will post a picture of the map so you get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Now the geography, like I said, was the major problem. For one, there wasn't much room to manoeuvre around, as the area is completely surrounded by either mountains, or of course you've got the Yellow River in front of you. Now beside fighting again, fighting with this dangerous river beside you at all times, because remember, the Yellow River likes to change course a lot and it does cause a lot of problems. So that's a whole different kettle of fish. So, what should the UN do at this time? Because he doesn't really want to cross the river, because then if he does, he's got the river at his back, and there isn't really, you know, you can't really retreat once you've done that. I mean, you're fully committed. And that's not even mentioned in the fortifications yet. Now, the fortifications between the army and Dashin uh, were pretty heavily guarded by Sui troops, under the leadership of a capable general named Chu Tu Tong. However, not everything was against Liu Yuan. He could find allies in the area. One said ally was a man named Sun Hua, a well-respected government official. Sun Hua crossed the Yellow River and met Li Yuan, who received him with the highest honours and then bribed, <coughs> sorry, I mean uh, convinced him that he should join the House of Tan. Gaining new allies in the form of government officials in the area, the momentum was gained for Li Yuan, and soon not just government ministers, but even local bandits joined the Tan army. Liu Yuan sent one of his generals named Wang Changxie to cross the Yellow River with a mixed army of infantry and cavalry to march to capture Chu Tu Tong's position at Hudong. Chu Tu Tong would then be faced with a dilemma. Defend the city and allow the Tang forces to surround the entire area of Danxin, or to flee to the capital and put up a last stand there. While Chu Tu Tong decided that the only chance the Sui had at victory at this stage was to defend Hodong and defeat General Wang's forces. Afterward, they could fortify their position a bit better. As Wang's army had begun to finish setting up their fortifications, Chu Tu Tong sent his lieutenant named Sang Xiangke to raid across their camp under the cover of darkness. Taking their elite cavalry, Sang Xiangke gave the order to drop the platoon bridge on the Yellow River. Him and his cavalry then ran to Wang's camp, which had not been properly established yet, and smashed into the enemy lines. Taken completely by surprise, Wang ordered his men to give up ground, but in an orderly way. Once the Tang army was looking at like it was going to break, Wang ordered his cavalry to skip around their lines and into the enemies, and then the cavalry detachment could smash into Sui forces from behind. Now seeing that they were surrounded, Sang Xiang He withdrew back to toward Ho Dong, and now it was Chu Tu Tong's turn to be under the pressure. Wang Chang Xie's forces now besieged Ho Dong. Li Yuan now had a bit of another dilemma. Should he finish Chu Tu Tong off before proceeding to the capital, or should he rush to Da Xin and take everyone by surprise whilst exposing his rear? Now many argued that the most sensible and practical solution was to take Hudong and finish off Chu Tu Tong first. From there the capital was wide open. However, it was Li Shimin once again who argued differently. He said, We have won victories. If we push on to Dashi now, they would not be ready for us. Speed will conquer. The strategists will not have plans. The fighters will not have organized their tactics. But if we spend time in an extended siege, Many of our newfound allies will leave us. Bad morale would strike our army and our enemies will perfect their preparations. Chu Tu Tong had enough to do to defend Hodong. 
leave in there and take that scene. Li Yuan once again correctly sided with Xu Min and left General Wang to basically keep Chu Tu Tong in his place at Hudong whilst the rest of the army went to take Da Xin. Upon hearing that Li Yuan was personally marching toward Da Xin, Chu Tu Tong did indeed try to break out of Hudong. He left a commander by the name of Rao Jun Su to keep Hudong while he took a crack troop force of 30,000 men out to march toward Da Xin. And they made it! <laughs> Almost. <laughs> they got to the road and linked up with the Sui forces at a pass known as Tong Wan Pass, only to find their path blocked by Li Jian Chung, who had lay there in ambush, anticipating a move like this. The fighting was intense between the two sides, but Chu Tu Tong had now found himself locked safely away within the pass, with no way out to Da Xin. Once Li Yuan arrived at the walls of the capital, he tried his best to keep the PR stunts going basically. He ensured the civilians were not harmed, he even sent the Sui court multiple messages saying he was only there to protect the Sui dynasty, but he was of course a court. Then the Tang army began to build their siege equipment, because I'm guessing that the capital walls were perhaps too high for human ladders when they insulted the other city. Now. When they were building their siege equipment, normally that would probably be a good time to try and sally out and cause a bit of disruption, but no, they meant very little to no resistance. And when it finally came to them assaulting the city, again, there wasn't much resistance. The men scaled the walls, opened the gates, and let the rest of the army enter the city. As simple as that, as easy as pie. Li Yuan then elevated the 13-year-old Yang Yo as the new emperor of the Sui dynasty, titled Sui Gong Di. Emperor Yang, his father, was far away in Jiangdu, which is a modern-day Jiangsu province, and he was far too busy chasing those southern haughties that he always fancied for concubines whilst his empire fell apart. Soon, Emperor Gong rewarded Li Yuan the title the King of Tang, and then appointed him Prime Minister. From there, Li Yuan would take the ultimate step, remove the child emperor from power and proclaim a new dynasty by 618. Li Yuan removed said child emperor and then named himself Tang Galzu, therefore officially ending the Sui dynasty for good. Now the new regime had a lot of work to do though. They didn't exactly inherit a stable situation and a new crisis would emerge within the imperial family. Well, that's the new imperial family. Li Jiancheng was named the heir, so he was going to be the next emperor. Li Shimin was named the Lord of Qin, and the third son was named the Lord of Qi. Now, would the three brothers simply agree to the arrangement, or fight for the top spot? Well, for those of you who have skipped a few pages in your history books, you know what happens next. But for those of you who don't, Tune in for the next episode, which we will discuss how the brothers and the royal families love each other so much. So tune in next time, and see you then. Thanks for listening.